I am really, really very delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker uh, for the symposium, uh, Professor Gabriel Egan. Um, Gabriel is a professor of Shakespeare studies at De Montford University in Leicester. And he's also one of four general editors of the new Oxford Shakespeare, which is an edition of the complete works of, of Shakespeare. Um, I understand that there have been various volumes uh, released so far, one being the modern critical edition, and there was a critical reference edition with an authorship companion. Um, and I understand that you're about to release um, an edition of complete alternative versions of Shakespeare. Gabriel is also director of the Centre for Textual Studies at De Montford University, and that centre's current projects include the Oxford Shakespeare, clearly, uh, but also uh, projects such as the correspondence of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and also Thomas Mallory's, a project on Thomas Mallory's Mont d'Arthur. Gabriel has been the PI and co-I of numerous um, AHRC and other funded projects. For example, Shakespeare's London Theatres was a project. He's, he's been sort of very prominent in funded, with funded projects that have a, um, a digital uh, component. For example, Shakespeare's early editions um, and um, a project called Transforming Middlemarch, which is a genetic, a digital genetic edition. Um, I was curious to discover that it's an edition of a TV, it's a genetic edition of a TV script of Middlemarch. Um, so that's, it's worth, it's worth a, it's worth a look. Um, Gabriel publishes widely in Shakespeare, drama, digital scholarly editing, digital text editing, XML and TEI. He's, he's pretty much what I always consider to be the poster, poster child of digital humanities in that he uses and explores technology and computational techniques to undertake research that is grounded, that responds to, and that often questions long and deep traditions of scholarship. And we know that Gabriel is a serious scholar because he's got his own personal website <laughs> in which <laughs> lots of his activities are described. And it's worth, it's worth um, browsing um, gabrielegan.com uh, to, to see some of these. Uh, you can, from his website, you can download Perl and Python scripts for, for editing. You can, you can access a vir the virtual printing press, which is a 3D model of an early modern printing press. And curiously, one final item on the website is just called music. <laughs> And here you can access WAV and MP3 audio files of digitally remastered cassette tape recordings of Portsmouth's 1980s rock music scene, which includes, very, very um, excitingly, um, a previously unheard interview with Depeche Mode. Okay, this divides the audience <laughs> along age lines. <laughs> Uh, Gabriel is a man of many interests and talents, and we're going to hear about some of them now. Over to you, Gabriel. Thank you very much for those kind words, Michael. Thank you to the conference organisers and the university for this event and for the invitation to speak to you on digital scholarly editing with and without collaboration. I should say that for the purposes of the recording of this speech, uh, I'm making the whole of it available under a Creative Commons uh, BY license. We've discovered a great deal about Shakespeare's authorship in the last few years. We've learned about his capacities as a writer and about his practices of collaboration. The new knowledge has been created by the new things that computers and digital text enable us to do, and they change what editors it's must do. Yeah. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> These new developments change what we as editors must do because we have new ideas about Shakespeare's capacities as a writer. And I suspect that what's true of Shakespeare 
will be true of other authors too, but I'd be very happy to have, have people ask if that's true in their area. But I think our notions of authorship are changing, must change. Let me summarise three new and surprising facts about Shakespeare that digital scholarship has recently established. The first is that Shakespeare did not coin any new words. We now have in digital form a large proportion of the English writing that predates Shakespeare's. We can, in every case that I can find, we can find someone else using, before Shakespeare did, every word for which the Oxford English Dictionary uh, tells us that the earliest usage it has is by Shakespeare. That is, we can antedate all of the words that the OED would otherwise make us think Shakespeare had coined. Knowing this affects how we edit Shakespeare when we find an unusual word in one of the originating documents. If we thought that Shakespeare habitually coined new words, we might be tempted to treat an unusual word as a possible new coinage rather than as an error. For instance, in the first edition of Shakespeare's Richard III, Richard says in his opening soliloquy, Plots how I laid, inductious, dangerous. The word inductious might be an error for inductions, which is the reading from the 1623 first folio that editors usually prefer. That is, plots have I laid, inductions, dangerous. Or, inductions might be a new coinage by Shakespeare that simply did not catch on. We don't use the word inductions now. Knowing that we were wrong so long to think that Shakespeare was an inveterate word coiner helps us in deciding what to do here. The second discovery recently made is that Shakespeare did not have a large vocabulary. In fact, your vocabulary is always certainly larger than Shakespeare's. He was remarkably average in his vocabulary size. Now, knowing this is not especially useful to editing <coughs> Shakespeare, although it does helpfully moderate the reverence that some people feel when dealing with Shakespeare's text. The computational methods by which we figured out the size of Shakespeare's vocabulary are themselves interesting, and I can describe them afterwards if anybody is interested. The third discovery is co-authorship, and this is the big news. According to the new Oxford Shakespeare Complete Works Project, there are 43 plays that are wholly or partly by Shakespeare. These are the 36 plays in the 1623 first folio, plus Pericles, published in 1609, and the two noble kinsmen, published in 1634. And those are two additions to the canon that I think few will find controversial. Plus, five more that are disputed. These five are the, Arden, uh, the play Arden of Faversham, published anonymously in 1592, the Spanish tragedy published anonymously in 15, also 1592, attributed to Thomas Kidd by Thomas Hayward in 1612, Edward III, published anonymously in 1596, Sir Thomas More, that was unpublished until 1844, and that uni uniquely survives in a manuscript, partly in Shakespeare's handwriting, and Cardenio, published in 1727, in heavily adapted form. So these are the five plays that we, in the New Oxford Shakespeare, are claiming have some Shakespeare in them. And that the complete works of Shakespeare, we say, must have 43 plays in it. And furthermore, of those 43 plays, only 27 were written by Shakespeare on his own. The remaining 16 plays contain Shakespeare's um, writings, but alongside the writings of other men. And those 16 plays, in chronological order of composition, are these. I won't read them all out, but those are the 16 co-authored Shakespeare plays. And that's over a third of the canon, co-authored. Now, some of these co-authorship claims are controversial. Not everybody agrees. Most Shakespeareans have for some time accepted that Titus Andronicus was co-authored with George Peel and that Henry VIII was co-authored with John Fletcher, even though both of those appeared in the 1623 folio with only Shakespeare's name on the title page. Other co-authorship claims that I present here are discoveries of the New Oxford Shakespeare project and they're not accepted by other scholars. But even if we take away the contentious claims, for more than half of these plays, 
Virtually all professional Shakespeareans are in agreement about the co-authorship. So we have to think through what co-authorship means for the editing of Shakespeare. Until recently, it didn't mean very much at all. It made almost no difference. In an influential study of collaborative playwriting in 1997, Jeffrey Maston argued that our efforts to separate out the individual labours in a collaboratively written play are doomed to fail, because in fact authors can and do merge their styles when writing together. The collaborative project, writes Maston, in the theatre, the whole of it, the whole fact of theatre being a collaborative art, is what he means. This was predicated on erasing the perception of any differences that might have existed, for whatever reasons, between collaborative parts. Collaboration is, as we shall see, a dispersal of authority, rather than a simple, simple doubling of it. To revise the aphorism, two heads are different than one. Maston's view of collaboration was based on French literary theory from the 1960s, and in particular, in Maston's case, the work of Michel Foucault. Controversy alert coming up. We now know, I'm saying, that the claims about authorship made by the French theorists Roland Barthes and Michel Foucault in particular grossly misled two generations of literary scholars, including myself, I admit. It turns out that authorship is not a will-o'-the-wisp that we are unable to trace with empirical methods. The author is not a function that we apply to texts in the act of reading and making sense of them. The text is not, and I'm quoting Bart here, is not, I would say, a tissue of quotations drawn from the innumerable centres of, of culture. Rather, authorship is an objective and measurable fact of writing that we can analyse with empirical methods that give us dependable, reproducible results. And collaborating authors, we now know, did not merge their styles in the way that Mastan suggested. He thought they did because French literary theory told him that they would. Fifteen years ago, Hugh Craig summarised the case against the post-structuralist view of authorship that has dominated literary studies for the past 50 years. Craig writes, in the case of authorship, statistical studies, like his own he means, might have revealed, were free to reveal, that authorship is insignificant in comparison to other factors like genre or period. In that case, the theory that authors are only secondary to other forces in textual patterning would have been validated. As it happens, however, authorship emerges as a much stronger force in the affinities between texts than genre or period. Unexpectedly, perhaps uncomfortably, it, that's authorship, is a persistent, probably mainly unconscious factor. Writers, we might say, can't help inscribing an individual style in everything they produce. We need to take account of this in a new theory of authorship. Craig is referring to the many recent studies that have revealed measurable differences in the styles of different authors and have shown that when multiple authors collaborate on one play, we can distinguish who wrote which bits. Now that we can distinguish authorship, we have to edit different parts of a multi-author text differently, respecting at each point the local author's preferences as they are revealed elsewhere in other works, and judging the need for emendation by that author's habits elsewhere. The old post-structuralist model of authorship relieved us of this burden because it told us that when two or more authors blended their styles, it became one seamless whole. Now that we know this to be untrue, we have to shoulder the burden that the structuralists had relieved us of. Editors of co-authored texts for which the shares have already been determined must now edit each part in the light of its author's personal habits. Editors of texts where co-authorship is suspected but has not been established have to investigate the possibility of co-authorship for themselves or get someone else to do it. The first question to be addressed then is just what aspects of language should we attend to in order to distinguish authorship?
I won't be giving you an entire summary of the field, but I want to outline two main approaches and the differences between them. That is, studying rare words and phrases, and studying common words and phrases. We can count the use of these words and phrases in the text to be attributed, and in the canons of our candidate authors who might have written it. If we're concerned with rare words and phrases, we typically look for those that occur only in the text to be attributed and in one candidate author's canon. If we're concerned with modern, sorry, if we're concerned with common words and phrases, we look for the candidate whose frequency, or frequencies rather, of use regarding these words and phrases are closest to the corresponding frequencies of use in the text to be attributed. When we attribute significance to our finding that a certain rare word or phrase from the suspect text appears in the canon of a candidate writer, we have to bear in mind that different writers' canons are different sizes. The eight dramatists from Shakespeare's time who've left us the most plays have these canons of sole-authored works. Shakespeare has the largest canon, 27 out of the total of 101 plays here. If we imagine this set of 101 plays as a target surface in which we might find any particular word or phrase that we're looking at, it's clear that Shakespeare presents a larger surface area in which to find a match. If our searches for matches are like darts that are randomly thrown at the target, then all else being equal, our darts will land in the Shakespeare sector more often than in any other, merely by virtue of its being the largest sector. So I'm speaking here of the significance we attach to finding or not finding rare words or phrases in particular authors' canons. As we, shall, as we shall see, the problem of different canon sizes scarcely affects studies that look for common words and phrases, but it does affect studies that look for rare words and phrases. Looking at this problem and thinking for yourself what you would do to solve it, you might think that to correct for different canon sizes, we could say that a hit for green is weighted at seven times more significance than a hit for Shakespeare, because the green part of the target is only one-seventh of the size. This is the procedure undertaken in the tables of Pervez Rizvi, whose online data set, Collocations and Engrams, as it's called, is the primary attribution tool used in the current project to edit the complete works of Thomas Kidd, being led by Brian Vickers. The attributions in that project are based almost exclusively on Pervez Rizvi's tables. By um, authorship analysis, this project to edit the works of Kidd, led by Brian Vickers, has expanded the Kidd canon, which, when I was an undergraduate, was a canon of one. The plays of Thomas Kidd were just the Spanish tragedy. But in the early 2000s, a book by Lucas Erner convinced most of us that, in fact, Kidd also wrote the play Solomon and Persida, and we knew he had translated the play Cornelia from the French. But the complete works of Kidd, currently in progress, has added to that Arden of Faversham, King Lear, L-E-I-R, the play from 1605 that inspired Shakespeare's play, Fair M, the first part of Henry VI, and Edward III. I want briefly to show that the adjustment made for different author canon sizes that was applied by Rizvi, on which these attributions depend, is unnecessary if one is counting common words and phrases, and invalid if one is counting rare words and phrases, as the Kid Project does. Take the uncommon word water, which is the 636th most frequent word in all of Shakespeare. This is how it is unevenly distributed across the plays, based, uh, sorry, listed in alphabetical order from left to right. The play with the most occurrences, The Tempest, 
has 14 times as many <coughs> occurrences as the plague with the least. Much ado about nothing. For contrast, let us see how the word in, which is the tenth most common word in Shakespeare, is evenly distributed across the plays. Here the spread is far less. Henry V has 156 occurrences per 10,000 words, which is not even double the Winter's Tale, which is the least, with 87 occurrences of in per 10,000 words. What happens then if we extrapolate from a small canon to a large one? If we weight our hits so as to scale up the smallest canon to the largest? If we had only four Shakespeare plays, as we have only four Thomas Green plays, would they give us an accurate sense of how many occurrences of in and how many occurrences of water to expect in the larger canon? We can test this directly in the case of Shakespeare because we do have the larger canon. Here, I show along the x-axis an increasing canon size, taking the plays again in alphabetical order. For both words, for both tables, both charts rather, we start with just one scene from the first part of Henry IV, then one act of the first part of Henry IV, then the first, sorry, first one scene from that play, Henry IV part one, then one act from that play, then the whole of that play, Henry IV part one, then Henry IV part one plus Henry IV part two as two plays, make that a canon, then add one more play, much ado about nothing, to make a three-play canon, and so on until we've added one play each time to get to 27. For each reconstructed canon, we calculate the rate of use of the words in, the tenth most common word in Shakespeare, and water, 636th most common. We can see on the left that once we get to four plays, the rate of in remains almost constant. It doesn't matter how many new plays we add to the canon. We only need a four-play canon to get a good sense of the range of usage of that word in in any larger canon of Shakespeare. But for the word water, the pattern is quite different. We see that the effect of adding the third play, much ado about nothing, that's the first of the red lines moving left to right in that second chart, putting that play in it's a play ex exceptionally low in the use of the word water, drags down the rate for the three-play canon markedly. Then adding the fourth play, Antony and Cleopatra, which has an unusually large number of the word, occurrences of the word water, takes the rate for the four-play canon right up again. Then our five-play canon is even worse than our four-play canon for predicting the rate of usage of water, since its rate is lower. There's a four there from four to five plays. And our six play canon is even worse. It's, been, it's lower still. Not until we have 14 plays in our canon, and that's the red line in the middle, is this collection <coughs> starting to show a rate of usage of water that is even as much as a th a two, a three quarters of the final rate for the 27 plays. In other words, the small canon is not a good predictor for the usage of that word in the larger canon. In these examples, growing our Shakespeare canon from one play to 27 plays, I've taken them in alphabetical order, which is effectively random order. In the worst case scenario, by which I, by which I mean if our four play canon happened to be the four plays in which our candidate author used the words in question the least, if they were least representative of his style, then the problem is far worse. Actually, it's far worse for the word water, but not for the word in. I haven't got the time to show this, um, that the problem is in rare works. They are not a good guide to who's written what. For the word in, the problem is barely present. A small canon is representative of the larger canon. You can use a small amount of an author's text to predict his or her usage of those, of those rare common words in a larger set of texts. I haven't got the time to show this, um, it's a general problem, though, with uncommon words. We should not use them for authorship attribution because they are unevenly distributed across any author's canon. Now, there's much more to be said 
about the methods for distinguishing authorial styles so that we can detect co-authorship. But as a general principle, it's safest to look at the rates of common words rather than rare words because of this problem of uneven spread. Of course, one would not base any authorship claim on the use of one word. But even counting just two common words gives us useful data about authorship. Here is what we get if we plot on the x-axis how often each of our eight dramatists uses the word the, and on the y-axis how often he uses the word and. So each dot represents two counts, one for the word the horizontally and one for the word and vertically for each of our eight dramatists' canons. For the Shakespeare canon, I removed as you like it from the set of 27 plays, and I've plotted the usage of the and and for just the remaining 26, certainly Shakespeare's sole authored plays. Then we count those words, the and and, in as you like it, and see where it falls on the plot. As you can see, the dramatist whose rates of using the and and are closest to the rates found in as you like it is Shakespeare. His dot is the nearest one to the As You Like It dot. If As You Like It were a play of unknown authorship, this plot would tell us that, regarding those two words at least, Shakespeare's habits are, amongst the habits of the eight candidate dramatists we're looking at, his habits are the ones most similar to the habits found in the play. We can, of course, count the rates of usage of more than two words. Typical experiments count the 50 or 100 most common words. We cannot, of course, display 100 counts on a two-dimensional plot like this. We would need 100 dimensions. But the mathematical formulas that tell us which dot is nearest to which other dot work exactly the same way in 100 dimensions, even though you can't imagine 100 dimensions. They work the same as they do in two dimensions. Finding the nearest dot to the dot you've got is trivial. But even if you have a reliable, a reliable method for determining authorship, it's not obvious how you would find where one author takes over from another author in a co-authored text. It may be that you have reason to suppose that the authorial stints were organised by an artistic unit, say, by scene, or by acts in a play, or by chapters in a novel. Evidence from the papers of the theatre impresario Philip Henslow give us reason to suppose that the act, the dramatic act, was sometimes the unit of authorial composition in Shakespeare's time, so that different writers would be given the task of writing different acts in a play. But we cannot assume that this always happened. We have to look for where the authorship habits change, rather than make assumptions about where they'll fall. One successful approach to detecting authorial stints is called rolling windows. Suppose we want to be able to detect the presence of a single run of lines, say, totaling 1,500 words, by a second author, here coloured in red, within a play that is otherwise all written by the main author, here coloured blue. And suppose we know that the minimum block of text that we can reliably detect the authorship of is 2,000 words, and that our test will always point to the author who wrote the majority of the words in that 2,000 word block. We could do what this picture tries to represent, which is test each successive 2,000 word block in our text. But there's a good chance that, as here, the run of 1,500 words by our second author that we're trying to detect will not fall wholly within any one of our 2,000 word blocks. And hence that the verdict given for each block will be that the main author in blue wrote it because the second author in red never happens to predominate in any one block. If instead we make our 2,000 word window roll across the text, creeping forward 500 words at a time, then as it rolls over the block of 1,500 words by our second author, there will be several successive windows in which the second author's words predominate. 
So we creep forward 500 words at a time, mostly finding each block is by the blue author until we hit our run of 1,500 words. And at some point, it comes to dominate a window. And the verdict for that window is red, and red because it predominates in that window, and red again, and then back to blue. We will not, by this method, be able to say precisely where the second author's stint begins and ends. But we will know the approximate location. For this method to succeed, the window size needs, window size needs to be just a little larger than the smallest block of secondary writing we wish to detect. And also it needs to be large enough to bring in enough writing for reliable determination of authorship. So much for digital methods for detecting co-authorship. I want to present to you a particular case which comes down to us as a play in manuscript form in which, because it's a manuscript, there are additional layers of information about authorship. There's the different handwriting by the different writers and the different inks used by those writers in that manuscript. The play is Sir Thomas More, which I've just finished editing for the New Oxford Shakespeare Complete Alternative Versions edition to be published next year. This part of the New Oxford Shakespeare project is being created by the editors in Text Encoding Initiative XML that the publisher, Oxford University Press, has agreed to ingest directly. We edit the plays in Oxygen, XML editor, and inside Oxygen we run an extensible style sheet language transformation provided by the publisher, which turns our XML into HTML to give us an instant proof to check that we are encoding things correctly. I expect that for tonight's audience, working this way in TEI XML is unexceptional. I should say that when I speak at Shakespeare conferences, it is entirely exceptional. Um, I know of one large collaborative Shakespeare editing project that has been trying for 15 years to switch to TEI XML um, and has not managed it. <coughs> there is, in the Oxford Shakespeare project, there is innovative digital scholarship in our authorship attribution investigations that we're doing for the edition. And there's digital scholarship in our systematic use of large data sets of published books so that we can edit each part of a multi-authored work in the light of the habitual locutions of that part, that part's author, as shown elsewhere in other works. So naturally for this we use the Early English Books Online Text Creation Partnership, or EBO TCP dataset. And for our work, the best interface to this dataset is the Early Print website from Washington University in St. Louis. The Early Print project, as you may know, has applied morphosyntactic tagging and limitization to the EBO TCP dataset so that one can search by part of speech and by dictionary headword. And the early print search engine accepts regular expressions, which those from the commercial providers of EBO TCP do not. What is special and challenging about the play Sir Thomas More is the complexity of the collaborative authorship. Shakespeare contributed one scene and perhaps a couple of additional scattered speeches. The play survives as a manuscript in the British Library and was not printed until 1844. The title page of John Jarrett's Arden Shakespeare printed edition of the play gives you a sense of the problem. It reads, original text by Anthony Munday and Henry Chettle, censored by Edmund Tilney, revisions coordinated by Hans C, revised by Henry Chettle, Thomas Decker, Thomas Haywood and William Shakespeare, and for this edition edited by John Jarrett. Because this is a manuscript play, Jarrett wanted to convey certain details of the manuscript that he thought his readers would be interested in, such as deletions and additions marked in various ways. The alterations in the manuscript leave us with a set of problems about agency, 
since we have the writings and the crossings out of traditional authors, Monday, Chettle, Decker, and Hayward, and Shakespeare, some of whom wrote the original play, and others who revised the play. And alongside their writings, we have the crossings out and the insertions of various symbols and ruled lines and whole words of someone we call Hand C, a theatrical scribe who supervised the integration of the revisions into the existing material. And we have the crossings out and insertions of various symbols and ruled, li ruled lines and whole words by the state censor, Edmund Tilney. Here's a particularly thorny moment of crossing out. Top half of the slide. The main handwriting here is Shakespeare's. Writing a new version of a scene in which Thomas More, Saint Thomas More now, manages to quell a riot by force of his rhetoric. Hans C has crossed out four and a half lines, which in Jarrett's edition underneath is shown by underlining with a superscript C at the beginning and end of the underlining to attribute agency for the deletion. Hansi also added four words of his own, tell me but this, interlined above his deletion and which Jarrett encloses in superscripted letter C. <sighs> Within the material by Shakespeare that Hansi crossed out, there are other deletions by Shakespeare that he made as he wrote the lines. And these are explained in Jarrett's textual notes, but not represented in his text, not in the main body. The TEI standard and guidelines are fully equipped to deal with a complex case of multiple hands, making the multiple insertions and deletions present in this example. The TEI can handle this. I don't think readers can. <laughs> it seems to me that Jarrett's typographical codes will mean almost nothing to almost all readers of the Arden Shakespeare edition that he's created. Those who can make sense of his codes might as well use W.W. W. Gregg's Malone Society reprint edition of the manuscript itself, which I'll put at the bottom of the slide. Jarrett wanted to present to his readers, quote, alternative readings in the revised state of the text. I doubt this is achievable in a printed edition of this particular text because it is so complicated. And I have not seen a digital edition capable of adequately presenting alternative readings in such complex cases. If you know of such a digital edition that can present in a comprehensible way to an ordinary reader such complicated cases, I'd be very grateful to know about it. I'm not, I need to perhaps reconsider this matter. Where the alternative readings of the manuscript give us a choice, in my edition, I make the choice, instead of leaving it to the reader. And I give the justification for my choice in the textual notes. My edition aims to present the play as its creators intended it to exist after all the revisions written by Chettle, Decker, Hayward and Shakespeare, had been integrated into the original text as written by Monday and Chettle. This version of the play that I aim to present is not fully realised in the manuscript that is our only authority. And so I apply my editorial labours of completion to the manuscript. These labours are limited by me to the creation of text that would have been acceptable to early modern theatre professionals as the basis for a script that could be acted. Clearly, my editorial policy entails a hierarchy of authority regarding the persons whose handwriting is present in a manuscript. I had to rank the collaborating co-authors. At the bottom of my hierarchy, with least authority, is Edmund Tilney, the master of the revels, whose job it was to censor the play. Indeed, he could be said to have negative authority in my hierarchy, since rather than respecting his labours, I actively seek to undo whatever effect he has had on the text, because censors are the enemies of artists. And that raises a problem, since in this case, the censors' prohibition of the dramatisation of these London citizens' uprising against foreigners 
would make untenable the entire play as conceived by its authors. That is, Tilney perhaps was right that you couldn't show this, that he was right to censor the play and say that may not be performed. We cannot take partial account of Tilney's interventions in this script. They're all of a piece. So I say we must set aside the whole of them and present the play as its authors intended, even if, as well might be the case, Tilly was right and the resulting play could not have been performed. Hans C. was a professional theatrical functionary. He coordinated the integration of the newly written sections into the original text to produce the revised version. His labours on the revisions including deleted, included deleting material that was no longer needed, rewriting stage directions to manage new entrances and exits, and making notes about casting the roles. These tasks make Hans C. effectively an authoring partner with the dramatists, and almost all of his interventions in the script are accepted by me. But Hans C. also made mistakes, and where these mistakes are things that I think he would have put right if someone had pointed them out to him, I do not adopt Hans C.'s mistaken readings. Instead, I put, them right, I put them right for him. The example on screen is a clear mistake by Hans C. The problem is Shakespeare's habitual lack of punctuation. Hans C. thought that a sentence ended here, giving... And your unreverent knees make them your feet to kneel to be forgiven. If that is correct, if the sentence ends with forgiven, then what follows makes no sense as a new sentence, because it begins, Is safer wars than ever you can make, whose discipline is riot, in into your obedience, why even your hurley cannot proceed but by obedience. Hans C. can make no sense of this, so he deleted it all and he invented in its place the simplest bridge. Tell me but this. But of course what Shakespeare actually meant was, and your unreverent knees make them your feet. New sentence. To kneel to be forgiven is safer wars than ever you can make, whose discipline is riot, in into your obedience. Why, even your holy cannot proceed but by obedience. So here we must disregard what Hans C. did. Where a dramatist has apparently changed his mind in the course of composition, for instance by crossing out a word and writing a near synonym directly after it, I adopt the second thought in preference to the first. So here in this line is Shakespeare. He's written, even your wars, and then crossed out wars, presumably remembering that he's used it in the previous line, and substituted Hurley. So I adopt Hurley and merely give a note about the deleted wards. Where the deletion of whole lines appears to be a dramatist's decision about his own work, perhaps thinking he can do better, as with Anthony Mundy's first attempt to end the play, I accept the deletion and omit the lines. Likewise, where a deletion seems to be hand C and represent something forced on him by the task of combining the revisions with the original script, I again adopt the deletion. But where I cannot reasonably attribute deletions to these causes, my failure to find a principled explanation for them leads me to ignore the deletion marks and present the deleted matter to my modern reader with a textual note about my decision to retain it. In general, where multiple lines are marked for deletion, and I cannot tell by whom. My preference in a section of writing in hand C is to retain the lines, unless I have evidence that the dramatist who composed that section would have agreed to the, to the deletion, while my preference in sections of writing not in hand C, but by one of the dramatists, is to delete the lines, unless I have evidence that he would have preferred to keep them. That is, in general, and unless I have a special reason to do otherwise, I do not allow Hans C. to unilaterally delete a dramatist's lines, but I do allow dramatists to delete their own lines. You will have noticed that the editorial principles I've just sketched place a high value on what I think an agent would want to do, 
as when removing from the text the result of Hansi's error, because I think that Hansi would want us to do that if he had realised his error. This is avowedly, explicitly, an editorial position that treats authorial intention as something we can and should recover. And I believe that our recent digitally enabled discoveries about <coughs> authorship support that position. The New Oxford Shakespeare is a collaboration of nine editors, but necessarily there is a hierarchy, since the general editors choose the editorial principles for the edition and the junior editors must follow them. But there are hierarchies within hierarchies. I am the most junior of the general editors on account of my joining the project long after the others had done much of the work, and frankly because I am the youngest in terms of career years, and indeed in calendar years. But until I joined it, the project was not planning for the editors to work directly in TEI XML. That was my contribution. And within the team, I am the one who decides exactly how we're going to use the TEI guidelines to create the edition we want. Specialism generates its own seniority. This seems to have been also true in early modern theatre. As a mere scribe, Hans C. of, of the Thomas More was considerably less important to the playing company than Shakespeare and the, or any of the other dramatists were. His position in the hierarchy was lower, but he had specialist skills that the others lacked, and they accorded authority to his writing because of those skills, not on the basis of his overall status. Hans C. made mistakes, but when he was operating in accordance with the collective intention of the collaborating team, his decisions could override or refine those of Shakespeare or any of the other dramatists. Here's a concrete example of that. Shakespeare wrote, this is, part of Shakespeare, this is the beginning of Shakespeare's contribution to the play. Shakespeare wrote speeches for Lincoln, the leader of the rioters, and provided Lincoln's name as the speech prefix. Shakespeare wrote speeches for the other rioters to respond to what Lincoln is saying, but he did not differentiate those speakers. He wrote other as the speech prefix, meaning that someone else from the crowd should answer Lincoln. Hans C. crossed out Shakespeare's pre speech prefixes for other um, and distributed the speeches to particular characters, George Betts, his brother Clown Betts, and Williamson. According to his judgment, Hans C.'s judgment, of how well the speeches fitted those characters as they had been developed previously in the play. An editor sensitive to the nature of dramatic collaboration that Hans C. and Shakespeare were engaged upon would, must, I would argue, prefer what Hans C. wrote here to what Shakespeare wrote. To be consistent as a Shakespeare editor and to complete the incomplete intention to which the manuscript is witness, an editor has to here suppress the writing of the greatest dramatist the world has ever known and in its place put the words of a humble playhouse scribe whose name is lost to us. In their collaboratively editorial labour, back then, as in ours now, specialism generates its own seniority. Final remark. Paradoxically, sometimes, people collaborate without meaning to and with people they do not like. By collaboration, I mean here that multiple people's endeavours are complementary and add up to more than the sum of their parts. I'm thinking of the unintended collaboration that can emerge between rival teams because those teams do not get along. I referred briefly to the authorship attribution work of Brian Vickers and his team producing a complete works of Thomas Kidd. It is no secret that Brian Vickers has a low opinion of the authorship attribution work of the New Oxford Shakespeare. Or, nor that we hold a low opinion of his team's authorship attribution work. For everybody else, this mutual disdain can be a bonus. One of the great dangers in authorship attribution is confirmation bias. Convincing yourself that something's been proved because you want to believe it. My team and Brian Vickers' team have no incentives to agree with each other. When my team and Vickers' team agree on something, as we agree, for example, on Shakespeare's hand in writing additions to kids' play The Spanish Tragedy, we are not agreeing because we like each other and we want to agree. We have every reason to disagree with each other. Only the overwhelming force of evidence makes us agree. 
We approach the attribution questions using completely different methods, and yet we concur. There is no confirmation bias at work. By a perverse kind of teamwork, born of professional rivalry, we confirm each other's findings. In such a circumstance, you may be more than usually sure that our conclusions are correct. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. That was fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, your, your use of blank slides there sort of leaves constantly questioning whether the projector has stopped working. It's quite disconcerting. Uh, we have time for questions.